the Ferguson T20 tractor, or Little Grey Fergie, the machine that revolutionized farming. Gordon, John, and Graham Charity used six T20s on their 300-acre farm in North Cambridgeshire. of these tractors was built nearly 40 years ago, but there are still thousands in use all over the country. In my opinion, nobody could improve on the T20, and I doubt whether they ever will. They've lasted so long because they've been engineered properly, not like the rubbish we buy today. Oh, a nice little tractor, very useful, handy. When you're in, uh, when you're in row crop work, they're easy, you know, you can get on and off easy, adjust them easily. Not going to climb up into a great high cab every time you've got to get up and do something. Smashing. A good little tractor, I agree. They're easy to work with, easy to get on and off. You can do anything with them. Pretty neat. Say they're unique. Unique. <laughs> The T20 was the culmination of a lifetime's work by its inventor, Harry Ferguson. He was born in 1884 on a small farm in the north of Ireland. John Lachlan farms not far from where Harry Ferguson grew up. His family have been farming in this area since the 1820s. Harry Ferguson, as you know, grew up on a farm outside the moor in County Down. And he had witnessed all the drudgery and slavery that was involved in farming in his youth. And being an inventive man and a good engineer, he decided that there, were, there was great scope for mechanizing farming to take the drudgery out of it. Before the TE20, most farming was done by horses and human labor, making the work extremely slow and arduous. By the outbreak of the First World War, there were over a million horses on farms in Britain. Wesley Lewin was born in 1916 and grew up on the farm in Norfolk that he and his son Michael still work today. He remembers the days before the TE20 when just keeping the horses fed took up a quarter of his land. All the farms in this area had horses, nothing else, and there were no tractors about, none at all. And the farms were much smaller, and everybody had horses. There was no every farm around here, every house had got a horse, one sort or another. My experience with the horses was there was a lot of trouble. I mean, you had to feed them seven days a week and stop with them all the time. When you want to go very often to work, you would uh, catch the horse in the grass field; he'd have a shoe off. So I'd have to walk to the three miles to the blacksmiths and have a new shoe put on the horse. And that was a half a day gone. There were tractors available, like the Fordson, but they were large and unwieldy. Dragging rather than controlling the implements, they were only useful for ploughing large fields. On smaller farms, the horse remained the only option. The Fordson was available pre-war. But by and large, they were, weren't used for cultivation purposes very much because they solely had a drawbar on them. And they were purely a hauling machine. Any implements they hauled were trailed behind and weren't controlled by the tractor at all other than pulling it. And they were cumbersome and really only suitable for flat land. And I think that was what tempted Ferguson to think that there had to be a way of converting something like the motor car to an agricultural machine. Whilst working in the motor trade in Belfast, Ferguson set out to design a new kind of tractor. He could see that it was the lack of control over implements which held existing tractors back. He developed a linkage system which brought the two together as one machine for the first time. A prototype of the black tractor went into production in England. 
but Ferguson fell out with the manufacturer and less than 2,000 were made. Eager to see his tractor mass-produced, he demonstrated it to Henry Ford in America in 1938. A deal was struck and Ford agreed to manufacture the tractor in the States, incorporating Ferguson's linkage system. The new tractor was called the Ford Ferguson. And on June 29, 1939, at Dearborn, Michigan, the product of their collaboration was first made public. American farmers were initially skeptical about the new tractor because of its small size. But once they saw what it could do, the Ford Ferguson sold in large numbers. Mr. Ferguson, will this machine be a success for the small farmer? Yes. It is deliberately planned to be a success for the small farm. We'll do all the work that animals do on the farm at less than half the cost. But the small farmer in Britain would have to wait. Plans to export the tractor were halted by the outbreak of war. By the time the war ended, Ferguson had plans for a new, improved tractor to be made in Britain. He was encouraged by the new Labour government, who saw its potential for post-war reconstruction. A meeting was arranged between Ferguson and the Standard Motor Company, whose Banner Lane plant in Coventry was lying empty. They agreed to build the new Ferguson tractor. It was to be called the TE-20. Alex Patterson came to Banner Lane in 1945 to run the engineering workshop. He had previously worked for Ferguson in Belfast. In this factory during the war, they built Hercules aero engines, and that contract was finished. This factory was lying empty. So overnight, we got a factory, and we got a guarantee for material to build the tractor. All we had to do was get on with it. The first T-20s came off the production line in October 1946. At last, a light manoeuvrable tractor was available to British farmers. The combination of three-point linkage and hydraulics made tractor and implement one and was sold to farmers as the Ferguson system. If you think of a tractor as a mechanised horse, then, of course, you build a plough on wheels to harness to it. Now, think of a tractor as a ploughing tool. Why not make the ploughshare part of it, without any wheels of its own, and couple it here, and here, and on top here. This three-point linkage, as it's called, is the crux of the idea. It makes every tool part of the tractor, not dead weight to be dragged. A lever at the driver's side operates a hydraulic pump to raise or lower the tool so you can plough at any depth at a touch of the lever. The impact of the new tractor was dramatic. Farmers were able to work faster and more efficiently. The TE-20 could plough in an hour what had taken a horse the whole day. When Theo Roberts returned from national service to his family's farm in 1947, the TE-20 had recently been launched. He persuaded his father to buy one and still uses the tractor today. The T20 we bought was the first one that came to North Wales. The first time I used the T20, I thought it was very, very manoeuvrable, very light to operate and uh, very convenient. Ploughing was the first job we did. The convenience of the Ferguson hydraulic system made it uh, work much lighter than ploughing with horses. The field I'm ploughing now with the horse it would have taken about four days. But with a tractor, it'll probably take me one day. Such stony ground, still the best tractor out. I 
was, I suppose, about 11 years old when the first grey Fergie came to my home farm. Uh, but I'd learned to drive a Fordson prior to that. And, you know, um, I would compare the difference between the Fordson and the Ferguson as going from a steam engine to a Rolls Royce. The Fordson was heavy, clumsy, a youth of 10 or 11 just hadn't the arm power to even turn it. Whereas the Fergie was like uh, driving a pram that was so light to handle and so easy to turn. Because the tractor and its system was so revolutionary, Ferguson established a training school. Here, salesmen, engineers and farmers were taught the mechanics of this new way of working. The school was at Stonely Abbey, a few miles from the factory. When we first started in Coventry, we had an educational problem because no one knew what we were doing or what the thing was about. So it was necessary to educate them and have a school to do it. Well, Stonely was the hub of the organization. We used to travel to and fro in it, and an old Daimler bus with fluid flywheel. We started the thing, and then you waited for 20 minutes for the smoke to clear to see which end to get on, you know? <laughs> but, uh, oh, good days. We were very close. It was a one big family of people with a common interest. The main course, which takes 10 days, is divided between work in the field and in the classroom. It deals with both theory and practice. Many of the students are, of course, already familiar with the basic operations of tractor handling and driving. But others have to begin right at the beginning. It was very important that no one get into the field to operate the thing without some sort of education. Certainly the salesmen had to be educated so they knew what they were selling in case they sold the wrong type of equipment. They must be able, when necessary, to advise farmers on how to make the best use of tractor and implements and how to get the full advantage of their flexibility. A network of tractor dealerships sprang up all over the country. But it was through large public demonstrations that ordinary farmers first came into contact with the new tractor. A big demonstration involved a lot of preparation. They were put them in the autumn after the farm, normally after the farmer had finished his harvest. Uh, it was advertised in local papers and the farmers weekly and so forth. You know. They would come along, it was a good day out. It was a, a gathering of farmers with a common interest. An advert come in the paper uh, the last fortnight in December 1947 that there was a demonstration with the Ferguson tractor at Doddington, which is 11 miles from here. And uh, I went. It was a very cold, rime frosty morning. And the only way I could get to Doddington there, which is 11 miles, as I've said, was on my bicycle, so I biked. I went to the demonstration. And I was rather impressed that day, and uh, I, I had a few rounds of play on, you see. The whole object of the exercise was to get them interested, giving them practical demonstrations, seeing is believing, see it working. The centerpiece of a demonstration was cultivating the small square. This was an area 20 feet by 27 feet, too small for a horse or any other tractor to work in. What you needed first, of course, was a coil of rope and five posts. Now the object is to back in through the gateway to the far corner and make five runs and then drive out of the gateway, reverse back in, drive out again to erase your wheel marks. Until the demonstration at Doddington that I went, I had never driven a, a, anything, whatever, a car, tractor or anything, so that was my first time. I think they were heroes, a lot of these farmers, because they had no idea of gears, they had no idea of changing their gears. Uh, the pedals, brakes, and clutches, the hydraulic controls. 
We make sure that the driver is conversant with all the controls. And then he tries his hand at driving for the first time. Ferguson service was extensive. When farmers bought a T20, the dealer came with it to make sure they knew what they were doing. I'm one of the many thousands who farm the Ferguson way. It isn't just a case of being sold a tractor and then leaving it at that. It's the kind of service we get afterwards that's important to us chaps. It was my job to see that they thoroughly understood the operation of the tractor and the equipment that they had bought. And when you were completely happy that they weren't going to kill themselves, then I got them to sign an installation certificate. A lot of people laughed at me because I had L plates on the tractor. I put in for the elation in the driving test, you see, then. And I played in the field with the L plates on them. They, they thought that a bit funny, but uh, I didn't mind. Uh. Wesley passed his test first time. He has been farming with the same T20 he bought in 1947 ever since. When we got the tractor, it was like a new world, I mean. A lot of people have said that when you had a tractor, you've got to keep one horse to do work what the tractor couldn't do. Of course, the Ferguson system cut that all out. That would, did, that would do everything that the horse could do quicker and better. The Ferguson's, well, I think one of their adverts was farm better, farm faster, farm Ferguson. That was perfectly true. You could farm better. When I sat on this little seat, I thought to myself, well, here I am. I've contributed to creating an empire. The T20 dominated the market. None of Ferguson's competitors had anything to match it. By 1951, the factory had reached peak production, building 325 tractors a day, 74,000 in that year alone. At one time, it was called the Grey Menace by some of the other tractor manufacturers because uh, they were selling more Ferguson's than any other make, I should think. Ferguson had always intended that farmers all over the world should benefit from his system. By the mid-1950s, the T20 was being used in over 160 countries. 70% of the 74,000 tractors turned out by Ferguson's last year were exported. These tractors are now working at all sorts of jobs in many different countries. As tractor sales grew, so did the sales of implements. Only Ferguson tools would fit the integrated system, and a whole new range of farm machinery had to be developed for the TE20. Plowing is only one job on the farm. An agricultural machine worth its petrol must do all the others too, better than a horse or a mechanical horse. A horse can't saw up logs. The tractor can, and dig post holes. There are 20 tools for 20 different jobs the tractor can do. Efficient mechanization has come to the farm. It wasn't just simply the tractor that had the big impact. The tractor was the prime mover. But as well as introducing the tractor, Ferguson introduced a complete range of implements for the tractor. And they were all incorporated with the hydraulic lift system of the tractor. And that was really what took all the slavery out of farming. Dick Dowdswell spent thousands of hours at the wheel of the TE20 without cultivating anything at all. And the T20 was a field tester. They all tested about 30 or 40 different implements, but then there was always modifications being made. So you all the time you were testing modifications as well as new implements. The job of testing was to drive the tractor as hard as possible over as rough conditions within practical farming use. Dick was <laughs> testing to destruction rather than testing for quality, if you like. Nobody was quite as hard as I was on the machinery. I think that if anything was going to break, I managed to make it break. You know. I, I had ways of thinking up hard jobs for them. He was destructive. But exactly what we wanted, he was serving a purpose. 
He would just laugh at you and say, well, I broke it. I don't think Mr Patterson worried too much, but he used to sort of call me the wrecker. But I think he was joking more than serious, you know. If you wanted something to be tested for a thousand hours, put Dick on it. And if it lasted a thousand hours, you'd go to bed and sleep. <laughs> he hadn't been able to break that one. <laughs> the uses of the T-20 went beyond farming. A range of 60 different implements took the tractor to places it had never been before. Playing fields, building sites, road construction. The roller is chain driven from the power unit's rear wheels and steered through an independent system. When the power unit is required elsewhere, it is a matter of minutes to disconnect. In 1953, Harry Ferguson, by now nearly 70, sold out to the Canadian firm Massey Harris. Just two years later, production of the T-20 came to an end. In ten years, over half a million tractors have been made, more than any other single British model before or since. Well, it was uh, not Mr. Ferguson's intention to go to production. He didn't want it to go to production. He'd be making it today if he was still around. He never wanted it to go to production. But fashions change. The 1960s saw the end of the T-20 era. Farms were getting larger, so tractors did too. All over the country, farmers replaced their 26 horsepower Fergies with new tractors of up to 100 horsepower. The company is still at Banner Lane, and has never ceased tractor production in nearly 50 years. The cheapest of the modern Massey Fergusons is now around 11,000 pounds. A single rear wheel costs more than the original T20. If you look closely at the T20 and look at any other make of tractor, any other make of tractor, you'll find all the T20 features are included there. They've still got the Ferguson three-point linkage, the same system. No matter how much they've developed in 50 years, big brother, little brother, whatever, T20 is daddy. And this legacy is acknowledged at the plant. The first T20 ever made dominates the entrance of the building as its inventor looks on. A plaque commemorates its achievement. I think the major contribution that the TE20 has made to farming has been that it has set the pattern for all tractors through its hydraulic system, that virtually all implements are nowadays controlled from the tractor seat. The interesting thing is that the Ferguson system, in some form or other, is employed by every tractor maker in the world today. On John Lachlan's farm, new and old coexist. Modern tractors do most of the work, but he still keeps a T20 for smaller jobs. The little Fergie hasn't completely disappeared. Most of the original half million may have been scrapped, but thousands are hard at work all over the country. It still comes into its own on jobs where lightness and manoeuvrability matter. still use the T20 tractor because it, it does a lot of jobs that the heavy one wouldn't do so well. Well, the job we were doing this morning was uh, hoeing sugar beet. It takes five rows at a time. We once upon a time, obviously, many moons ago, that was done with uh, one man and uh, one hoe. The tractor driver keeps it as accurate as possible, and the person on the back makes fine adjustments to the hoe with its own steering mechanism. 
And being you've got a man in the back to stay on it, you can go much closer to the sugar beet. And the closer you go to the sugar beet, the more weeds you get up. The more weeds you get up, the less you've got to hoe up by hand. Basically, we can still use the TE20 for any lightweight jobs on the farm, and it's used for that. We find it much better in the potato fields, particularly with a ridger, because the ridger was designed to withstand the pulling power of the 20, but it's not strong enough to withstand the pulling power of any of the bigger tractors, and on our stony land, if you put that ridger in a bigger tractor, you finish up with half a ridger just before you know you pull it apart. The TE20 has had a long life because it was a well-built, slow-revving engine of relatively low horsepower, so it was never under strain. And this one here is actually still original. The engine has never been overhauled. And after 40 years, that's not bad. The Charity family grow barley and potatoes, just the kind of work which suits the TE20. For them, it's a much cheaper option than buying new tractors. Well, we're quite unusual for having old tractors. Uh, most folk are geared up all modern tackle these days. But uh, we, we prefer to hang on to our money, use it in other ways. At the end of the day, they're very cheap to run. They're very miserly on diesel. Extremely miserly, mm. yeah. Two days on a tank full of fuel. Five gallons, two and a half gallons a day. Can you beat that? Mm. Almost take you to Scotland and that. <laughs> Theo Roberts does all the work on his 25-acre small holding with his original T20. Since we bought it, I've thought the world of the T20, and I wouldn't be without one. And of course, it served me for 40 years, and uh, they were so well made, very little maintenance, and I hope it'll serve me again for the next 10 or 15 years while I'm still alive and kicking. We shan't be like I was with the horses, we should never part with it. Uh, we shall keep it till it falls to pieces, that or me. I don't know which to go first. I think I shall, most likely. <laughs>